Ah, Kiev. You've been dreaming of getting here for years. Getting out your trusty camera, you start taking pictures of the cathedrals, aviation museum, and the Dnipro River, when, without warning, there's an enormous boom behind you. Turning around, you see something towering in the distance. It looks like a gigantic explosion. Uh Uh-oh, time to leave fast! In June 2020, what the people of Kiev were looking at was an anvil cloud, a rare storm formation in the sky. Forming when strong air currents carry water vapor upwards, the air expands and spreads out as it hits the bottom of the stratosphere. It pushes the dense cloud into the cool anvil shape you see, and sometimes it even gets to be a mushroom. Anvil clouds produce some of the most dangerous lightning of all storms, one that's called a bolt out of the blue. This lightning strike seems to magically come out of the blue sky with the storm being many miles away. This type of bolt comes from the top of the anvil and can be 10 times more powerful than a typical lightning strike. People got so frightened after witnessing a giant cloud just 60 miles away, thinking something terrible must have happened. The locals had pictures of the large billow on social media before officials could explain what was going on. Authorities managed to calm everyone's fears by informing them it was nothing more than a natural phenomenon, and a beautiful one at that. Before dissipating, these clouds typically stay in one area, regardless of how strong the wind is. Touring around the northern tip of Queensland, Australia, way away from those creepy crawlies, It's time to take a break and relax at the beach. Getting comfortable, you notice a great big shadow passes over you, then another, and yet another. Looking up, this weird weather is simply stunning. The clouds are called morning glory, a very rare type of cloud that almost seems to roll across the sky, looking like a massive tube. These clouds can measure up to 600 miles long, even appearing in large groups as well. This phenomenon is the result of an updraft pushing through the cloud, creating a rolling appearance, while moist cooler air at the back causes them to sink downward. Southern India, between July and September 2001. People witnessed one of the strangest weather phenomenon in recorded history. The rain was red. What many would have thought to be a typical rainstorm left them shocked. The color was bright enough to stain clothes. There were other colors too, such as green, yellow, brown, and even black. In the middle of a monsoon, red rain started to fall, and did so periodically for several weeks. Researchers have found this unusual rain is stained either by dust or algae, so don't try to catch any on your tongue. Scientists aren't entirely sure how the algae got all the way up there. This does make events like this a little unsettling. Like to take a bubble bath to relax after an exhausting day, but taking too long to fill the bathtub? Problem solved! Head to any coastline after a big storm and take a dip. Foamy tides aren't native to any one place or location. They can be formed anywhere in the world. They're most likely to happen along rocky coastlines, like the coast of San Francisco, Northern Ireland, or the Mooloolaba, Australia. Each coast has differing conditions forming the sea foams. If you scoop up seawater into a glass and look at it closely, you'll see it's full of tiny particles. Many things like plants, chemicals, and lots of salt and minerals create the perfect formula for foam. When powerful currents and wind mix it all together, we get something that resembles a cappuccino top floating on top of the water. When freezing temperatures hit orchards in Michigan, all kinds of unusual things happen. Like ghost apples. No, they're not going to scare you at all. But if you plan on sneaking away one winter to find one, be warned. Everything has to be perfect for this to occur, and it's going to be freezing cold. This is actually a rare weather phenomenon caused by having the apples freeze where they are with rain coating the fruit in a thin layer of ice. The apples then thaw and leak out like applesauce, leaving just the beautiful ice shell behind. 
The Catatumbo River in Venezuela might be the most electric place in the world, with nearly 300 storm days per year. The lightning storms are so consistent, they're predicted for three months in advance. During the wet season in October, you might see 30 lightning flashes in a single minute, a truly shocking experience. With each bolt having the energy to power a single light bulb for six months, the impressive display could power all of Venezuela forever. At sunset, strong winds flow around the three surrounding mountains, forming storm clouds over the water. As the water droplets of humid air collide with ice crystals from the cold air, it produces the static charges that cause the lightning storms nearly every night. If that wasn't bad enough, some storms have lightning above them as well. Try to take a picture of this one. Jellyfish lightning sprites are electrical discharges high in Earth's atmosphere. They're associated with powerful thunderstorms, but they have nothing to do with rain. These sprites occur 30 to 50 miles up in the sky, in the mesosphere. Artificial lights at night make it a lot harder to see this faint lightning. If you spot one, it'll look tiny, but can be well over 30 miles wide. The red sprites are a type of cold plasma discharge above a thundercloud. They're the balance of the lightning charges between the storm clouds and the ground below. Don't try to find this type of donut at your favorite bakery. It won't be there. Snow donuts are one of the rarest meteorological sites to see, with perfect weather conditions needed just to create them. Found in any snow-covered mountain area, like the Rocky Mountains, the wind, temperature, snow, ice, and moisture have to all work together for us to see these phenomenal rings. A thin layer of wet snow on the ground. Under that layer, ice or powdered snow. Then, a strong enough breeze to roll the donut down a hill, just like a snowball. Once it stops rolling, it can be the size of a baseball or as large as a car tire. It all depends on how strong the wind is. A newly formed snow donut won't stay around for very long, so hurry up with that camera! Watching the sunset over the horizon, the beautiful purples and pink overhead are nothing compared to the three suns you see in front of you. Wow, since when did Earth get three suns? These phantom stars sometimes appearing beside the sun are called sun dogs. Maybe they're called that because they're kind of dogging the actual sun? <laughs> sun dogs often appear as colored areas of light at the same height above the horizon as the sun. They're mostly observed on a ring or halo, where ice crystals best reflect the light. There are also moon dogs that appear alongside the moon and are formed by lunar light passing through ice crystals, though these aren't seen nearly as much as their daytime partners. Taking photos in the wild, you finally found the perfect spot to take that dream shot. The crystal clear water, the pines, the mountains, and the flying saucer. Wait, a flying saucer? Oh, aliens are here! <clears throat> you might be thinking this if you saw a saucer-shaped cloud. I'm not even going to try to pronounce their name, though. Put that on the screen, please. Wait, just kidding. It's Alto Cumulus Lenticularis. Aren't you impressed? These are really just unusual cloud formations over mountaintops. When moist air flows over a mountain, a wave is created if the temperature difference is perfect. As the air passes through the wave, evaporation occurs and a series of these clouds may form into an oval shape. Not aliens at all. Whew. The sky is falling! The sky is falling! Well. People who have experienced these clouds say they look like they're coming down from the sky. Mammatus clouds look like giant white lumpy marshmallows, but it might be hard to toast these ones. These weird fluffy clouds can extend hundreds of miles in any direction, remaining visible for short periods at the bottom of anvil or other thunderstorm clouds. The strange bubble shapes are formed from turbulence within the storm itself creating an uneven cloud base and appearing anywhere in the world. Mammatus clouds form when moist air sinks into dry air. The air must be cooler than its surroundings, 
cooled with ice, or be heavy with water. 50 ships and 20 airplanes have gone missing. Many people have disappeared, and mysterious forces might have... Oh wait, the wrong script. This Bermuda Triangle is located in Transylvania. My bad. So, once upon a time in the heart of Transylvania, there was a mysterious place that people named the Bermuda Triangle of Transylvania. Look at these twisted trees and their tangled undergrowth. It seems like some evil creature may appear from behind a tree at any moment. There might even be ghosts and mysterious creatures that came from space, as stories said. The forest became so popular in the 1960s when a man was chilling there on a warm August afternoon with his girlfriend and a couple of friends. Suddenly, his girlfriend pointed at something unusual in the sky. A man came closer to the spot where she was standing and, to his surprise, saw it too. It was a weird silver disc shining in the sky. He quickly pulled out his camera and took four photos before the creepy object bolted away. The object was there for a mere two minutes, but the man developed his film and the picture ended up being published in local papers. Many people were skeptical about this. They claimed that those were most likely some weather balloons that looked like a spaceship because they were photographed in odd lighting. But no weather balloons, blimps, or any other objects were in the sky above the forest on that day. Spooky, huh? That's not the only campfire legend from that area. Stories say that those who ventured too deep into the murky depths of this creepy place often did not return, which is how it got its nickname in the first place. There was a shepherd who entered the forest together with his 200 sheep. They were never found again. People have also been whispering stories about a five-year-old girl who disappeared one day. She re-emerged one day, five years later wearing the same clothes as the day she went missing. Plus, she hadn't aged a day. There are people who entered the forest and did manage to return, but with severe burns, high fever, and some other health issues they didn't have before. Some were sure that happened because the subsoil had lots of natural uranium with a high level of radioactivity. And according to others, it's not unusual that you come to this forest and feel like someone's watching you or your electronic devices just switch off. And now, here's something that's not a legend. The forest has a rich history. Some sources say it was home to the oldest settlement in Romania. Dating all the way back to 6500 BCE, trees themselves are pretty mysterious. They grow in creepy spirals or have some unexpected zigzag patterns. Even though some scientists have come there to explore this phenomenon, they couldn't find the answer to why they're like this. It seems as if trees are twisting their limbs so they can reach out and grab you when you're not looking. And that's what's interesting. Each of these twisted trees spirals in a clockwise direction. But legends say lots of inexplicable things have happened in a specific part of the forest where you can't find trees or any other types of vegetation. It's a perfect circle called The Clearing. The perfect name for a horror movie inspired by all these stories. The soil in this area with no vegetation has been tested and no one has found any weird stuff or anomalies that could potentially stop plants from growing there. Some locals believe the forest has positive energy which is why it's good to make a wish there. But many more people let their imagination run wild, telling stories about paranormal activities happening there, like mysterious spheres popping out in the middle of the forest or extraterrestrial lights. Either way, you and your castle can step aside, Dracula, because you're not the only scary story from Transylvania. Here's another reason you won't be able to sleep well tonight. The Isla de la Munecas, or the Island of the Dolls, in the middle of the eerie and murky waters of canals near Mexico City, there is a small island. It may look charming at first, until you realize it's home to hundreds of dolls hanging from the trees and scattered throughout the overgrown vegetation. These dolls are old and decaying. They've lost their color over time, and their once cheerful faces are now twisted into expressions of despair and horror. There is a sad story behind this disturbing place. It says the island used to be home to a reclusive man who left his family more than 50 years ago to live alone on the island. He started obsessively collecting dolls that were lost in the canal. The story says 
He even traded products he grew to locals to get more dolls. The man didn't clean these dolls nor show any interest in fixing them. He would just decorate his island with them regardless of the state in which he found them. Even those that looked good ended up ruined due to winds and rain. They weren't just outside, his cabin was full of these scary dolls too. Many people were terrified of this place, claiming it was cursed, but others believed the dolls safeguarded the island. Moving to the suburbs of North London, where you can find the mysterious Highgate Cemetery. It's definitely not a typical resting place for the dearly departed. This cemetery has so many peculiar graves, including those of Karl Marx and Douglas Adams. But that's not what draws visitors to its gates. People come there because of the legends claiming that this place is haunted by all sorts of spooky creatures, including vampires. Yup, stories about shadowy figures hovering over graves with glowing red eyes and sharp fangs never get boring. But this place wasn't always this creepy. It was established in the middle of the 19th century, once neglected and overgrown with crumbling monuments and vegetation that seemed to swallow up graves. But these legends became popular along with the place itself in the 1970s, after the cemetery had appeared in several horror movies. Some visitors there are even self-proclaimed vampire hunters. There's this peaceful and charming village called Pluckley, just a short drive away from London. At least that's what it seems at first sight. People whisper Pluckley could be the most haunted village in England. As you go through its winding streets, you'll come across many spots legends say are haunted. Many of them are connected to the Daring family, which held the title of Lords of the Manor for over four centuries. What gives the sense of old times is the round-topped windows on many buildings. Legend has it, hundreds of years ago, Lord Daring escaped when his enemies captured him. He jumped through one of these windows head first. In commemoration of this pretty daring act, every window in the manor house and the village was made in the same style. Even though the manor house burned down in 1951, the legacy of Lord Daring's escape lives on in the charming village of Pluckley. Some say Pluckley is surrounded by the so-called Screaming Wood. There are many legends about paranormal events that have occurred there. There are nice walking trails in this wood, but to be honest, I'd only be brave enough to hit them during the day. And how about the Crooked Forest? It's in Poland, and it consists of 400 pine trees whose trunks take a sharp 90-degree turn and then become weirdly curved, like the letter J. Someone planted them in the early 1930s, but it's still not completely clear how all these trees got the same curve. One scientist said this looked like a typical response to gravity. Plants have a special mechanism that allows them to reorient themselves when the stem is horizontal to gravity. So, these trees may have been grown this way for making boats or furniture. Of course, human imagination goes way beyond science, so many try to explain the existence of these trees with stories of spirits that possess these trees or mysterious creatures from space that made them this way. Okay, I'm on. Let me just grab my popcorn. The moon. Our little companion, our only friend in the our only friend in the big dark cold space. It's not surprising that any event related to it, like solar or lunar eclipses, excites us. But how about the black moon, the blue moon, a supermoon? Have you ever heard of them? Well, let me tell you about it and how you can observe them. Let's get your calendars ready. The distance between the Earth and the Moon is 238,900 miles, I've measured. Feels not so far, doesn't it? But trust me, most people greatly underestimate this difference. Did you know that every planet in the solar system, including Jupiter and Saturn, would fit between the Moon and us? Yeah, I couldn't believe it myself. The Moon is tidally locked to the Earth. That's why it's always turned to us with only one side. There are a few phases in a lunar cycle. The new moon is the first phase. The sun illuminates the unseen side of our satellite, so we can't see the moon. It's almost invisible in the sky. The rising moon is the gradual growth of the light part. The full moon is the phase during which the sun completely illuminates the visible side. The descending moon is a gradual waning of the light part. And finally, another new moon. And the whole cycle starts again. There are 29 and a half days in a lunar cycle. So it takes around a month if we're not talking about February. 
But why am I telling you all this? So you can better understand Black Moon, a rare astronomical event that happens once every 29 months or two and a half years. This term doesn't exist in astronomy, as it was made up by astrologers. It's unofficial and has several meanings. Black Moon may mean the second new moon in a month. Usually, there's only one new moon per month, so having two is a rare phenomenon. It's caused by a slight discrepancy between the lunar cycle and the Earth's annual one, something like leap years. Black Moon can also mean something else. For example, usually there are only three new moons per one season. Basically, one new moon every 30 days. However, if there are four, the black moon means the third one. There are also some less popular meanings. For example, that's what people call February without a new or full moon. This happens about once every 19 years. But what's so special about it? The satellite is wholly hidden in the sky during a regular new moon. But during a black moon, you'll be able to see its dark silhouette. You'll have to choose a good place without city lights. If you live in a big city, you'll hardly be able to see it without a telescope. Also, since the sky turns black during this phenomenon, you'll be able to see different constellations that were hidden before, as well as Jupiter and Venus. The last time this happened was on April 30th, 2022. You could observe it in most parts of the United States, except for areas in the Pacific, Alaska, or Hawaiian time. Aloha! Yeah, unfortunately, if this is the first time you hear about the black moon, you've already missed it. Now you'll have to wait another two and a half years. The next black moon will happen in September 2024 by standard definition and May 19th, 2023 by seasonal definition. But hey, don't worry. You can always see another astronomical event once upon a blue moon. Now, I'm not mocking you. I'm being serious. You can still see the blue moon. Well, not literally, of course. The moon won't turn blue. That's just what astrologers call the second full moon in a month. The black and blue moons are similar by definition, but they're actually the opposites. If the black moon is a rare second new moon in a month… Now, another interesting astronomical event is called the supermoon. Stock up on telescopes and look for some hills, because you'll see an exceptionally bright and large moon, like the one we only see in movies. What exactly does a supermoon mean? You see, the moon doesn't revolve around the Earth in a circular orbit. Its orbit is elliptical, and the place where it's closest to the Earth is called perigee. A supermoon is a phenomenon that occurs when the full moon coincides with the perigee. Because of this, it seems to us especially large and bright. It looks 14% larger in diameter and 30% brighter than usual. By the way, this phenomenon is often confused with the so-called moon illusion. During the moon illusion, the moon is low above the horizon and visually appears larger in size. Of the 12 or 13 full moons in a year, three or four are supermoons. But most of them are not very significant. You probably won't see a difference at all. The most interesting ones are the rare large supermoons. During them, the moon actually becomes big. The last major supermoon occurred in 2016. Unfortunately, large-scale supermoons are rare and occur about once every 18 years. The next one will happen only in 2034. But we can observe smaller supermoons quite often. In 2022, they'll take place on June 14th and July 16th. There is also an opposite phenomenon called the micromoon. You've probably already guessed what that means. It happens when the full moon is at its farthest point from the Earth. This point is called apogee. The next micromoon in 2022 will take place on June 29th. In 2023, we'll be able to observe it on January 7th, February 5th, and August 16th. Of course, you don't have to follow each of these events. Most people are more interested in lunar and solar eclipses. By the way, are you one of the people who confuses these two events with each other? Test yourself. Pause this video, describe what these two eclipses mean, let's compare your answer with the correct definition. Are you back? Okay. So, a solar eclipse is a phenomenon where the moon entirely or partially covers the sun. A solar eclipse is possible only during the new moon when the moon itself is not visible. Many people believe that this event is incredibly rare, but this is not quite true. A lunar eclipse is a phenomenon in which the moon is entirely or partially in the shadow cast by the Earth. 
The lunar eclipse can only happen during the full moon when the proximity of the moon is on the node of its orbit. If you guess right, well done! If not, hey, don't worry, many people confuse them. In 2022, a partial solar eclipse will occur on October 25th. It'll be visible in Europe, South and West Asia, North and East Africa, and the Atlantic. As I mentioned, a total solar eclipse is not as rare as many people think, but the problem is that it's not always visible from any part of the planet. So, if you want to see this event, be sure to look for their calendar and see from which parts of the Earth you'll be able to see it. And don't forget the special glasses. Lunar eclipses occur much more often, though. Partial lunar eclipses happen almost every month. But the total lunar eclipse in 2022 will take place on the night of November 7th to 8th you'll be able to see it in almost all parts of the world except Africa. I hear that the zebras are not happy about this. The moon is a genuinely fascinating satellite. You think, whatever, it's just a small rock ball. But in reality, there are so many interesting things connected to it. What rare lunar events have you seen or want to see in your life? Have you observed any rare and interesting astronomical events? Be sure to share in the comments. Hey, ever heard of a fire rainbow? Yeah, me neither. How about a circumhorizontal arc? Didn't think so, but just so you know, they're one and the same thing. At first glance, it looks like a painting, or like a rainbow-colored splash in the sky. Despite the name, they have nothing in common with either fire or rain. This phenomenon happens on basically naturally formed ice spikes. For them to be formed, They need a really cold and elevated environment where the air is dry. The sunlight turns ice directly into vapor rather than melting it into water. And that's why these blades of snow and ice start to pop up on the surface of the Earth. As cute as they may be, they can end up as tall as 15 feet. Now, what happens when small individual droplets of lava meet the wind? Pele's hair, basically. Let me explain. The word Pele comes from an ancient Hawaiian symbol for volcanoes. Whenever the wind picks up little drops of lava, it stretches them into hair-like strands, similar to the process of glass wire creation. These delicate strands can stretch as far as 6 feet. On rare occasions, it can rain without any clouds. But does it really? Let's look at the science behind this rare phenomenon. It's sometimes called a sun shower just because it looks like the rain is falling straight from the sun. Let's be clear, though. There is no way rain can ever come down directly from a star. Rain clouds are at a bit of a distance from that specific location. With sun rays being angled, the clouds become out of sight. Add a little wind to blow the rain in your direction, and ta-da! You get sun showers. Located in Bolivia is a place called Salar de Uni. It's the largest salt flat in the world. It's also the home of half of the world's lithium, which is a crucial component for making batteries. But what else is so special about this place? Well, whenever the rain season comes, it turns this piece of flat land into a perfectly reflective mirror lake. What comes to your mind when you hear about the Blood Falls? A horror movie? (laughs) Well, they are merely a series of waterfalls located in one of the driest regions of Antarctica. They emerge from an underground lake filled with a special kind of bacteria. These little organisms use sulfates as fuel instead of sugars, which makes them very intriguing for scientists. The water contained in this lake is so full of iron that it basically just rusts when it meets the air. Hence, the reddish color of the waterfall, which also gives it its trademark name. Okay, we all know the song, but it's not really made up. There is actually such a thing called a desert rose. It's not a plant, though, but a unique form of the mineral gypsum. It develops in dry sandy places that can occasionally flood. This constant switching between a wet and dry environment lets the gypsum crystals emerge between grains of sand, trapping them and forming a rose-like shape. Ever heard of the Eye of Sahara? Scientists are still trying to figure out how it was formed. You can only see it if you fly above it, but it's basically a naturally formed dome that dates back to approximately 100 million years ago. And no, I wasn't around then. It has a rough diameter of 25 miles and consists of a bunch of concentric rings. 
the biggest one, or the central area, measures about 19 miles in diameter. Astronauts were some of the first people to notice it, and it's been studied ever since. In fact, even to this day, when landing in Florida, they know they're almost home when they see the Eye of Sahara. One of the most beautifully colored trees in the world is located in the Philippines and Indonesia. It's called the Rainbow Eucalyptus. It got its name because of its bark that switches colors and peels away as the tree ages. The bright green bark is the youngest, as it contains a substance called chlorophyll, usually found in leaves. It then switches to purple and then to the color red. And finally, it turns brown as it grows and loses the chlorophyll. Now, don't be tricked into thinking that's a whole forest. It's one single tree. And no, it's not some sort of optical illusion either. Let me explain. Underneath that soil, there is a complex network of roots that connects around 47,000 tree-like shapes you see above the ground. It's called the quaking aspen. Some of these trees are among the oldest and largest organisms in the world. Now, here's a good destination for all travelers, or maybe not so good after all. The most lightning-stricken area in the world, according to recent data released by NASA, is Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. Out of all the days in a year, 300 of them feature thunderstorms in this location. What makes this area so unique, though, that storms happen so often? Well, it's because where cool mountain air meets the warm, moist breeze and generates electricity over the lake. The Eternal Flame Falls are located in upstate New York, near the Canadian border. In this region, there is a tiny waterfall with a big secret, a spark about 8 inches tall. Turns out there's a natural gas seat that provides fuel to the flame behind the waterfall. The waterfall provides enough coverage so that it stays lit pretty much every time. Hikers do enjoy to relight it if they see that it's been blown out. This phenomenon is actually quite common, but this one gained more popularity because it is younger than most. And it looks very good in pictures, let's be honest. I've heard of yellow sand, white sand, and even black sand here or there. But I've never heard of green beaches until now. Papacolia also known as Green Sand Beach, is located in Hawaii and is one of the few beaches in the world that features green sand. The unique coloring comes from olivine rock that was formed when a nearby volcano erupted. Actually, in Hawaii, all the volcanoes are nearby. Move over green sands because some of the other beaches around the world can even glow at night. And it's completely natural. The culprit? A little thing called photoplankton or microalgae, as they're sometimes called. They're basically little plants that contain chlorophyll and need sunlight in order to live and grow. Most photoplankton kinds are able to float in the upper part of the ocean, where the sunlight can still reach them beneath the water. When the photoplankton gets agitated by the movement of waves and currents, they emit light, which looks like some glow during the night. These special microorganisms are found on beaches in a lot of places around the world, such as the Maldives, Puerto Rico, and the Everglades. At the base of a mountain located just outside of Afton, Wyoming, is a little river called the Intermittent Spring. There are only three of this kind in the whole world, but what makes this little string of water so mysterious? Well, the fact that it starts and stops every few minutes. Scientists have yet to pinpoint precisely why this happens. They speculate that it's basically just a siphon effect that happens deep within the ground that causes the river to just start and stop so often. Should you ever be interested in checking it out, be sure to do so in the late summer, as that's when the intermittent spring is most active. Do you see the irony here? You can only see the spring in the summer? Okay, I'm... Kwajan Volcano in Indonesia is not your ordinary lava-belching mountain. Instead of producing black smoke and red lava, as most volcanoes do, this eccentric guy lets out a blue flame, an electric blue lava. This phenomenon occurs because the volcano contains some of the highest levels of sulfur in the world. And when the sulfuric gases interact with scorching air and get lit by the molten lava, they start to turn blue. Unfortunately, you can see this mesmerizing sight only at night, but you can smell it all day long. 
By the way, the world's largest acid lake is also located inside this crater. The Dead Sea has a high concentration of salt and minerals compared to other seas, even though it's technically a lake. Swimming is almost impossible, but people go there for the natural chemicals for the body. Floating on the surface is a great way to relax. This ancient body of water got its name because no macroscopic organisms can live there since it's 9.6 times saltier than oceans. Only a few bacteria and fungi can be found enjoying the salt. It's also Earth's lowest elevation on land at 1,400 feet below sea level. An underground crystal cave exists in Mexico, and it looks like some interstellar world. It's roughly 1,000 feet beneath the surface, with each spike measuring up to 35 feet in length and weighing up to 55 tons. These are some of the largest crystals in the world. Los Cantar Beach is an endless strand of white sand dunes in azure water. But don't let the tropical vibes fool you. It's located in Scotland. That's why it mostly looks like this during May and June only. In December, the place gets only an average of one hour of sunshine per day, making it way more dramatic and monochrome. The Georgia Guide Stones is a collection of giant stones in a star pattern. It has inscriptions in eight languages, including Hindi, Chinese, and Swahili. It also has an astronomical calendar finished in 1980 and was built the last centuries. No one knows who built it or why. All the way over in sunny California is Sequoia National Park, home to the giant forest. It's been around for thousands of years. More than 8,000 of these colossal trees rule the land including 10 of the largest living plants in the world. The General Sherman Sequoia is estimated to be up to 2,700 years old and is recognized as the world's largest known living tree by volume. The famous stone heads of Easter Island have been around for hundreds of years. No one knows exactly why they were built. Some scientists think that local people believe the statues would make the soil more fertile. Soil analysis proved the heads did their job well. It's the best agricultural spot on the island. The chemical composition of the ancient hot springs in Pamukkale, Turkey, makes the water pouring over the edge look magical. They're not only good for cleansing your body, but the mind, too. All the way in Saudi Arabia is a rock sliced perfectly in the middle with two pieces sitting parallel. What makes al Nasla so unique is that it wasn't artificially done, but is a result of nature's work over the years. Now this glacier may look like someone dropped tons of red paint in the middle of Antarctica, but it's actually the natural color. Blood falls is a result of extreme salted water mixed with iron oxide, giving out this eerie vibe in the middle of nowhere. In early May 2018, New England observed one of the scariest and most dangerous phenomena ever, a super long track tornado. The frightening natural phenomenon started not far from Charleston, New Hampshire, and traveled toward the town of Webster in Merrimack County. It took the tornado 33 minutes to cover 36 miles and become the third on the list of the longest track tornadoes in New England. In the Philippines, you can swim in some of the most crystal clear waters and discover an underwater world below you in the province of Palawan. The municipality of Koran has white sandy beaches with many small boats riding through the many amazing sceneries. Tristan da Cunha is a small volcanic archipelago in the Atlantic, with the only neighboring cities of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Cape Town, South Africa. It takes seven days by ship to get to this unique place. If you want to escape from the rest of the world, staying with the 280 locals will make you feel like you're away from everything. During the first week of January 2018, Unusually cold weather in the Northeast United States froze the Atlantic Ocean in North Falmouth, Massachusetts. What's more, the ocean was frozen so thoroughly that people were walking on the waves. Now, that's obviously something you don't see every day. Red sand is what makes this beach unique and why tourists flock to Tianjin, China. A red-colored plant called a sueda salsa dwells in the saltwater. The whole beach is covered in red, with only the top layer of the sea visible. If there ever was a thing that said, I defy gravity out loud, it's the Stone of Davasco in Argentina. 
The huge 300-ton boulder stands precariously on the edge of a cliff and rocks a little bit from side to side in the wind. People even checked it by putting glass bottles under one of its edges. They exploded with another movement of the rock. Unfortunately today, you can't see this wonder of nature as it was a century ago. In 1912, the boulder suddenly dropped from its perch, which it had occupied for literally hundreds of years. The people of the nearby town of Tandil were so sad about this event that 95 years later, in 2007, they decided to restore the stone. They made a plastic replica of the rock and put it on the same spot and even in the same position. So, even today, coming by Tandil, you can see its famous balancing boulder. More of a symbol now, of course, because it's no longer rocking and only weighs 9 tons, but instantly recognizable nonetheless. Socotra is an alien-like island off the coast of Yemen in the Indian Ocean with one of the most unique trees ever seen. It's called the dragon tree, and it can only be found on this amazing island. In 2008, it was labeled as a World Heritage Site. If you ever see a tight-burning column of air, don't panic, it's not the end of the world! The creepy combination of whirlwind sounds and scorching inferno means that you have crossed paths with a fire tornado, also known as fire twister or fire whirl. This dangerous phenomenon occurs mostly during wildfires. These fires create a big area of super hot air just above the ground. When this scorching air gets mixed with the cooler air higher up, it results in a whirlwind that churns up burning debris and flames. The most powerful fire nados can stretch hundreds of feet into the air. The House of Mystery in Gold Hill, Oregon, amazes its visitors with gravity-defying effects. You can't stand straight there, always leaning to the side and having to hold on to something for balance. Balls roll upwards. There's also a broom that stands perfectly still wherever you put it, unlike virtually everything else in the shack. The local Native American tribes called this place the Forbidden Ground, even before the house was built there, and they avoid approaching it. The owners of the shack, though, decided to turn it into an attraction, and they succeeded. They created an atmosphere of mystery around the place, and spread the news about it in newspapers and later on the internet, and voila! A perfect anomaly is made. In fact, it's no more than a curiosity. A human-made optical illusion that tricks your eyes and other senses. Now, if you travel to the Philippines, Indonesia, or Papua New Guinea, you'll have a chance to see some of the most unusual and cheerful trees in the world. The trunk of the rainbow eucalyptus looks as if it had been painted orange, green, red, purple, yellow, brown, blue, hey, you name it! Some trees are so bright that they seem artificial. The rainbow eucalyptus regularly sheds strips of bark, which reveals a bright green layer underneath. A bit later, this green layer gradually changes its color. And since the shedding happens at a different time in different places on the trunk, the tree starts to look multicolored and very attractive. Yemen is home to the oldest skyscrapers in the world and the oldest metropolis. The ancient city of Shabam is considered to be the Manhattan of the desert due to the collection of mud buildings popping out of the desert floor. It used to be a caravan stop during ancient times. In Russia, on the shores of the Baltic Sea, there's an enigmatic national park. The Dancing Forest is a place that no scientist has managed to explain so far. The pine trees of the forest are all crooked and twisted into loops and spirals. The forest didn't appear until the early 60s, when the pines were planted in order to make the sand dune in that area more stable. One theory is that it's the unstable sand that made the trees twist in such a way. Other theories for the crooked trees are strong winds, or even supernatural powers. Some people say the forest is a place where positive and negative energies meet, twisting the trees. Local legend says that if a person climbs through one of the rings of a tree, it'll add an extra year to this person's life, or they'll be granted a wish. I like that one. Speaking of bizarre trees, and I was, one grows in the region of Piedmont, Italy. There, a cherry tree grows on the top of a mulberry tree. The strange thing is that both trees are perfectly healthy. A continuous storm at Saturn's North Pole has an odd shape, a hexagon. This is probably because of the gradient of the winds. 
The total length of this cloud pattern is 9,000 miles, which is about 1,200 miles longer than the Earth's diameter. The hexagon has been observed for many years, but it gets even more mysterious because it changes color too. It used to be turquoise, but it has recently shifted to a golden color. The reason for the color change is that the pole gets exposed to sunlight as the seasons change. Now, rain isn't unusual for Oakville, Washington. However, this one still doesn't have any solid scientific explanation. Instead of common raindrops, People watch translucent, jelly-like blobs fall from the skies. These blobs covered about 20 square miles. Those who got really close to the rain experienced flu-like symptoms. What were the blobs? Researchers claim that the blobs contain human white blood cells. Later tests showed no presence of nuclei. Some people claim the blobs might have been evaporated jellyfish resulting in rain, or maybe even waste from a commercial plane. Walking rocks, also known as sailing rocks, move across the Death Valley National Park in California without any external intervention, leaving long trails in the dirt and sand along their way. Various time-lapse footages of the moving rocks have been taken. Scientists even installed GPS navigators on some of the rocks, and it showed that the rocks move at a considerable speed. Some researchers believe that the movement is due to thin sheets of ice that form overnight at freezing temperatures in the valley, letting the rocks move until it melts during the day. Or there was a Rolling Stones concert. Nah. The Batagaika Crater in Siberia looks like a doorway to the underworld. It's about a half mile long and over 280 feet deep, but it never stops growing. As it gets deeper, it exposes more underground layers. The layers show what our planet looked like thousands of years ago, as the slumps reveal the used-to-be climates. The crater appeared back in the 60s, and it all started with rapid deforestation. Trees no longer cast shade on the ground, and it got hotter. The permafrost melted, resulting in the crater formation. The throbbing hum in Taos, New Mexico has driven locals wild since the 1990s. The low-frequency hum deprives people of sleep and depletes their energy. Even though scientists have tried to find the source of the hum, they still haven't pinpointed its origin. Different variations of the hum have also been heard in the UK, Australia, Canada, and other areas of the US. Luckily, only about 2% of the world's population can hear it. The hums have been blamed on mechanical devices, multiple disturbances of auditory systems, and even animals. The West Seattle hum, for example, was blamed on toadfish. Fairy rings, also known as elf rings or pixie rings, are mysterious rings of mushrooms that appear in grasslands and forested areas. There's a lot of debate about why these fungi form a nearly perfect circle. Some superstitions claim that fairy dances would burn the ground, causing mushrooms to rapidly grow. In Costa Rica, there's an assortment of about 300 spherical stone balls. Locals call them las bolas, which is simply the balls in English. These stones have an almost perfect round shape. Some of them are huge, weighing up to 16 tons each. They're also made of different materials – gabbro, limestone, and sandstone. They're considered to have been put in straight lines in front of the chief's houses, but there's no precise information of their origin. Some myths claim that these stones originated in Atlantis. Mm. If you ever travel to the Mekong River in late October, you have a chance of seeing glowing balls rising from the water and beelining up into the air. Locals call these glowing balls the Naga Fireballs. The size of the lights vary. The reddish balls can be as tiny as a spark and as large as a basketball. There can be dozens to thousands of balls a night. Scientists don't have any solid explanation for why it happens, but it could be due to flammable gases released by the marshy environment. Some superstitious locals are sure it's all because of a giant serpent living in the Mekong. Great balls of fire! In Minnesota, on the north shore of Lake Superior, there's a park known for the Devil's Kettle. This is a waterfall that splits in two. One part of the river continues, 
while the other part disappears into a hole in the ground. Whatever object you throw into the devil's kettle won't reappear. Scientists still haven't fully explained where the water that drops into the hole goes. Devil's kettle is considered to be unsafe for people because it's nearly impossible to trace the flow. Yeah, not a place to go tubing. Grunions are fish known for their bizarre mating ritual. The females climb out of the water and onto the shore. They dig their tails into the sand in order to lay eggs. The legs stay hidden in the sand, waiting. Ten days later, the high tide comes, washing the newly hatched young to the sea. Scientists still can't give any solid explanation for this way of breeding. People who live in rural central Norway over the Hesdalen Valley can often witness floating lights of white, yellow, and red cross the sky. The lights appear both at day and night, and once back in the 80s, they were spotted 15 to 20 times in a single week. The Hesdalen lights can last just a few seconds, but sometimes they can last more than an hour. The lights move, seeming to float or even sway around. Some scientists believe that the reason for these lights is due to ionized iron dust. Others say it's combustion that includes sodium, oxygen, and hydrogen. Many people claim they're just misidentified aircrafts. Yellowstone Park has a famous boiling lake, but it's not the world's only place of boiling water. Deep in the Amazon, there's the 4-mile Chanay Tempishka River that's always hot. The name means boiled by the sun. Well, it's not exactly boiling, but it can reach 196 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to cook pasta. Ooh, let's try that. The lowest temperature in these waters is about 113 degrees. This river still can't be scientifically explained because it would require close proximity to a volcano for the water to reach such temperatures. However, the closest volcano is 400 miles away. But there could be a fault between the Earth that could explain this phenomenon. In western Venezuela, locals living close to the Catatumbo River aren't afraid of lightning because they see it almost every single night. It starts at around 7 o'clock and doesn't stop until dawn. The everlasting Catatumbo lightning did once stop for a few months, from January to March 2010. It was probably due to drought, or maybe the charge ran out. In 1991, a scientist suggested that the phenomenon happens because of cold and warm air currents meeting in the area. Another theory is that the lightning could be due to the presence of uranium in the bedrock. Speaking of lightning, I got a bolt. Bye! You're taking a stroll on a warm summer afternoon. The grass is green, the sun is in the sky, and suddenly, you feel yourself sinking. You begin to panic, but then immediately you bounce back up. You test your footing and jump slightly. The grass bounces with you, like a trampoline. This phenomenon is caused by soil liquefaction. Excess water from heavy rain or floods becomes trapped in the soil, causing it to be waterlogged. This makes the ground temporarily act like a giant waterbed. While it may be tempting to run and bounce on this springy grass, it's best to tread carefully. The grass could potentially break open, and if someone fell through, it would be incredibly tricky for them to get back out again. An erupting volcano is already a pretty terrifying sight, with clouds of dark smoke and flowing molten hot lava. What's even more terrifying is that they can produce lightning. Volcanic lightning is pretty hard to study, so scientists don't know exactly what causes it. A common theory is that during an eruption, the ash picks up so much friction that it creates a buildup of static electricity. This static electricity then triggers the volcanic lightning. A fire whirl, or fire tornado, is exactly what it sounds like. They occur when ground winds pick up flames and escalate the embers into a whirling force. These spinning columns of fire can reach up to 1,000 feet tall, but luckily, they only last for a couple of minutes. Fire tornadoes are pretty rare, but they can be extremely dangerous. In Tokyo in 1923, a large citywide fire produced a gigantic fire tornado. The tornado lasted 15 minutes and devastated the city, causing significant damage and leaving 38,000 people injured. On a cold and cloudless winter night, you might have been lucky enough to witness colorful beams of blue and orange light reaching up towards the sky. These are called light pillars. They occur when light is reflected from tiny ice crystals that float about in the atmosphere. 
These pillars are more common in cold, northern countries like Canada or Russia. We've all seen the colorful rainbow arches that the sun produces. It's much rarer to see a rainbow light up in the sky, produced by the moon. This is called a moonbow. It's bright and colorful like a rainbow, and occurs when moonlight reflects off water droplets in the sky. Moonbows are incredibly rare, and can only occur in specific conditions. The moon must be very low, the sky has to be dark, and rain must fall directly opposite from the moon to create this lunar rainbow. If you're taking a moonlit stroll along the beach at night, you might come across the strange phenomena of a bioluminescent beach. This occurs when a microorganism in the water called plankton are agitated by the movement of the waves and give off a bright blue color. These microorganisms tend to live in warmer waters, so you can find these luminescent beaches in places like the Maldives, Puerto Rico, and even Florida. In Antarctica, you'll find the famous Blood Falls. Blood red colored water pours out of the Taylor Glacier from an underground lake. Scientists originally believed that the striking color was caused by a microorganism similar to the luminescent beaches glowing plankton. But after further studies, it was discovered that the water has abnormally high levels of iron that oxidize and turn to rust the second they hit fresh air. In colder climates where lakes are frozen all year round, if you look pretty closely beneath the icy waters, you'll notice frozen bubbles trapped in the ice. These are small pockets of methane gas. Bacteria in the water feast on other organisms and digest them to produce methane. The methane turns into floating bubbles in the frozen water, trapped beneath layers of ice. Asparatus clouds are one of the rarest events in nature. This cloud formation consists of incredibly dark and storm-like waves of clouds. Although these clouds appear ominous and look like they carry a heavy storm, they usually dissipate without ever affecting the weather. These clouds most commonly appear in the Great Plains of the United States, but they haven't been observed since 2009. Despite being a famously harsh climate, the desert can produce some beautiful things, like desert roses. These are intricate rose-like formations of crystal clusters. The intense switch between dry and wet conditions forms the crystals and traps grains of sand within them to give them their signature color. From afar, you could easily mistake a water spout as a large tornado traveling over a body of water. In reality, water spouts are a type of funnel-shaped cloud. They are rotating columns of cloud-filled wind which often take on a darker color. Water spouts are much weaker and smaller than tornadoes, and they aren't strong enough to suck anything into them. This phenomenon typically occurs in tropical climates, and they usually dissipate before reaching land. Lenticular clouds are flat clouds that lay on top of the other, looking like stacks of pancakes in the sky. They typically form in high altitudes where geographic features like mountains or tall buildings interrupt the airflow. Because of their unique shape, lenticular clouds have been suggested as an explanation for some UFO sightings. As our climate changes, new natural phenomena develop. One of these is exploding permafrost. The increasing temperature in Arctic zones is causing the permafrost to melt. Just like in frozen lakes, bubbles of methane gas are trapped in the permafrost. As the permafrost begins to melt, the gas is released. This results in large explosions in the ground, which leave behind massive holes. The first case of this was reported in 2013, and several more have been reported since. When you think of icebergs, you usually think of a large chunk of pristine white ice. But in Antarctica, you find icebergs striped with colors of green, blue, yellow, and more. The different colors are caused due to the ice forming in special conditions. Green typically appears when water that is rich in algae freezes. Blue stripes are more often freshly frozen water. Other colors are typically caused by sediments of debris picked up by the water as it freezes. Nacreous clouds are some of the rarest clouds on the planet. They typically occur at high altitudes and are only visible within two hours after sunset. The clouds appear beautiful as they display light waves of various colors. But don't be fooled, these clouds are actually a pretty dangerous sight. Nacreous clouds are incredibly destructive to our atmosphere. Their presence encourages the chemical reaction that breaks down our ozone layer. The ozone layer is an essential shield protecting us from the sun's harmful rays. The more depleted it is, the more at risk we are of global warming. The last place you might expect to find a natural fire is in the middle of a waterfall, but it's more common than you think. In upstate New York, in the middle of a small running waterfall is an eternal flame around eight inches tall. 
Beneath the waterfall is a natural gas seep, a low pressure of gas that escapes from underground into the Earth's atmosphere. The small fire is sheltered enough by rocks from the waterfall's spray to stay lit permanently. Typically, green sand isn't what you'd imagine when you think of tropical beaches. But in Hawaii and other volcanic islands around the globe, you'll find beaches covered with dark green sand. This remarkable color is due to the erosion of olivine, a type of rock formed by nearby volcanic eruptions. Over the years, the rock slowly withers into sand and washes onto the shore, resulting in these strange colored beaches. Penitentes are fields of ice spikes formed in high altitudes. These occur when sunlight beams directly onto ice, turning it into water vapor rather than melting them. The sunbeams vaporize small dimples in the snow surface, resulting in sharp crystal-like formations. The spike can grow as tall as 15 feet. Mammatus clouds are some of the most unusual and distinctive formations of clouds. The clouds can extend over hundreds of miles and appear like the sky has been blanketed with cotton balls. The clouds themselves are harmless, but they often signify that a dangerous storm is nearby. So if you see them, head inside. A green flash sunset is a rare phenomenon that occurs briefly at sunset or sunrise when the sun is almost entirely out of the sky. In the right conditions, onlookers can witness a distinct green flash, making the sun appear bright green. This is caused by sunlight reflecting off the Earth's atmosphere, causing the light to refract into different colors. The sun appears green, but really, it's just an optical illusion. The Boxing Day Tsunami, Indonesia. An undersea earthquake starts in the morning. Its tremors cause a series of tsunami waves. The largest reaches the height of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Unzen Volcano, Mega Tsunami. A powerful volcanic eruption triggers a landslide from a 4,000-year-old lava dome. It sweeps through the city of Shimabara and reaches the sea, setting off a mega tsunami. The Vajon Dam Mega Tsunami, Italy. A landslide drags 9 billion cubic feet of forest, soil, and rock into the lake. A dark wall of water covers the sky over a tiny village at the bottom of the Vajon Dam. Then, with a deafening roar, the wave overtops the edge of the dam, taking out everything in its path. Mount St. Helen Mega Tsunami, USA. As the volcano erupts, the upper 1,500 feet of Mount St. Helen collapses into a massive landslide. Part of this avalanche plunges down into nearby Spirit Lake, which splashes the lake waters into a series of waves almost as tall as the Eiffel Tower. Alaska's Latuya Bay Tsunami. A landslide caused by an earthquake creates a mega wave. It surges over the headland and washes away trees, plants, and soil down to bedrock. Molokai, Hawaii. A third of the East Molokai volcano caves in and collapses into the Pacific Ocean. This causes a tsunami the size of the second tallest building in the world, Shanghai Tower. The waves reach Mexico and California. The Yucatan Asteroid Tsunami The asteroid, which is rumored to have wiped out dinosaurs, strikes the Yucatan Peninsula. It creates a mega-tsunami, the largest in Earth's history. The first wave's almost twice bigger than the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa. Hurricane Mitch Mitch forms in the Western Caribbean Sea. Soon it strengthens to become the eighth most powerful Atlantic hurricane ever. The storm pours 4 inches of rain per hour for two days in Honduras. It causes terrible mudslides and floods. Hurricane Allen Rare and extremely powerful, the storm is one of the few to reach Category 5, the highest possible. It causes more than $2 billion in damage. The Great Hurricane After tearing down Barbados, the storm moves on. It strips the bark off the trees growing on Martinique and St. Lucia and travels further. This horrific natural disaster lasts for six days. Hurricane Dorian It's the most powerful tropical cyclone to hit the Bahamas. The hurricane flattens most of the structures on the islands and sweeps them into the sea. Hurricane Wilma The storm occurs in the Caribbean Sea near Jamaica and heads to the west. Two days later, it gathers enough power to turn into the most intense hurricane ever recorded in the Atlantic Ocean. Hurricane Patricia 
A regular storm develops a well-defined eye and turns into a Category 5 hurricane within a mere 24 hours. At one point, it travels faster than a Ferrari moving at its top speed. It makes Patricia the world's most intense tropical cyclone ever recorded. Kamchatka Earthquake It happens in the early morning 80 miles away from the shores of Kamchatka. The earth tremors produce a tsunami. The first two waves are catastrophic, up to 60 feet high. The third one's much weaker. Valparaiso Earthquake, Chile It happens at about 5 a.m. along the boundary of two tectonic plates. The tsunami, triggered by the earthquake, wipes out 620 miles of Chile's coastline. Tohoku Earthquake, Japan The first earth tremors start at a great underwater depth. The earthquake is so strong, it moves Japan's main island. It shifts the planet on its axis by up to 10 inches and increases its rotation speed. The disaster also triggers a tsunami with 133-foot high waves that travel 6 miles inland. Indian Ocean Earthquake, Sumatra A rupture along two tectonic plates sets off an undersea earthquake. It begins at about 8 a.m. near northern Sumatra, Indonesia. It makes the planet vibrate nearly a half inch and sets off earthquakes all over the world up to Alaska. Good Friday Earthquake, Alaska The most powerful earthquake recorded in North America lasts for 4 minutes and 38 seconds. A 600-mile-long crack causes terrible landslides and a 27-foot tsunami. Areas 200 miles away get raised by 30 feet. Other places permanently drop 8 feet. Valdiva, Chile The great Chilean earthquake starts in the afternoon and lasts for no less than 10 minutes. The disaster affects an area the size of California. It triggers tsunamis that reach the shore of Hawaii, Japan, the Philippines, Australia, and New Zealand. The average tornado usually lasts less than 10 minutes, but there are exceptions. El Reno Tornado It's considered the world's largest tornado based on width. At its peak, the twister reaches 2.5 miles across. The Perryville Tornado, U.S. It occurs at about 2 a.m. and starts with snapping hardwood trees and breaking down stone constructions. Then the whirlwind becomes stronger. It levels two-story buildings, flips and tosses cars as if they were toys. Bridge Creek Moor Tornado When the twister gets into the town of Bridge Creek, its width is at its peak, 1 to 1.5 miles. The wind speed of the tornado reaches more than 300 miles per hour. This natural disaster causes $1 billion in damage. Manitoba, Canada An outstanding tornado rages for nearly 3 hours. It breaks tons of trees and utility poles, damages roads and farmhouses, but miraculously misses every town on its path. Tri-State Tornado, U.S. The world's longest-lasting single tornado travels 220 miles through Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. The average tornado's path is usually no longer than 5 miles. Tupelo, Gainesville, U.S. An outbreak that consists of at least 12 single tornadoes wipes out everything on its way. The accompanying rainstorms also trigger severe flash floods that make matters even worse. Valjant Landslide, Italy At 10 p.m., a landslide with a volume of 100 Great Pyramids of Giza breaks off from the top of Monte Toc. It falls into the Valjant Dam Reservoir, producing a tsunami wave taller than the Golden Gate Bridge. Yunnan, China An avalanche of rock, stones, and mud, so big it could fill up Sydney Harbor, forms a dam on the Jinsha River. The Hida River, Japan Triggered by a rainstorm, 300,000 Olympic swimming pools of debris flows down before getting stopped by another, earlier landslide. Along the way, the landslide sweeps two buses off the road. Peru A rock slide dams the Rio Montanero, a long river running through the center of Peru. The whole process takes no more than 3 minutes, which means the landslide moves at a speed of up to 87 miles per hour. It also leaves a trail of debris 5 miles long. The Usoi Dam, Tajikistan Set off by a magnitude 7.4 earthquake, 
The rock slide falls into the Murgab River and blocks its flow. That's how the Usoi Dam, one of the tallest in the world, appears. Mount St. Helens, USA At 8.30 a.m., after much buildup, a volcanic vent finally gives way and sets off a catastrophic eruption, which makes the entire north side of Mount St. Helens fall away. It's the world's largest recorded landslide. North Bonneville, U.S. In the middle of the 15th century, a great earthquake occurs. An incredible amount of debris rushes down from Table Mountain. It covers more than 5 square miles and blocks the Columbia River with a dam 200 feet high and 3.5 and miles long. You plan to spend your summer vacation in Africa. The final destination is the Sahara Desert. It's located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. You're excited to ride camels and learn about the region's rich cultures. You hop on an extensively long flight, and finally, you are here. You find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Can you believe it's 3 million square miles? You're ready for your first adventure after drinking liters of ice-cold water. The guide gives you a choice. You can spend two weeks visiting a collection of oases, or you can help them solve an ongoing local mystery. Deep into the desert, near this Algerian town, lies a mystery begging to be solved. A collection of huge, spotted circles in the sand. There are dozens of them, stretching for miles in a straight line. The circles were first identified via Google Earth images several years ago. People have debated them for years, but no one seems to know the answer. The strange thing is that they are so many miles away from any towns, roads, or human activity. The quickest way to discover the truth behind the circles is asking questions. You grab your notebook and set up to talk to locals. Everyone is helpful in this scenario – geographers, anthropologists, elders, and historians. The first person you talk to is a map expert. You need to understand if those circles were authentic or a satellite glitch. You end up interviewing the people who take Google Earth satellite pictures. The circles are really there. They appear in multiple pictures from many years. Then, let's understand why they are there in the first place. After two days of interviews, you have your first lead. The circles could be the result of oil activity. Experts explained why this would make sense. Algeria is a rich area for natural resources, so this would be a sensible guess. Usually, to find out if there is anything worth extracting, companies would undertake seismic surveys. Seismic surveys are a way of analyzing the Earth's surface by sending shock waves into the ground. Depending on how these waves bounce back, you'll know what is located there. A special vehicle could have marked the soil that way. So, did we unravel the mystery? Mm, not quite so. As you know, the Sahara Desert is one of the driest areas on the planet. The average high temperatures in summer are over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. To survive there, people need to find ways of accessing water. So, these circles could be a kind of ruin or leftovers from ancient water wells. Again, I'd say this is a sensible guess. Ready for some fact-checking? Some anthropologists agree that these circles could be ancient fogueras. Fagera is the name of a 2,500-year-old style of irrigation system, usually found in northern Africa. It is also known as a kanat in other places in northern Africa. Locals would dig a deep well at an elevated point, deep enough to tap into underground water. They would then dig parallel shafts at regular distances. Then, they would dig an underground channel that connected the city to the well. Solely with the help of gravity, water would run from the well to the city. This traditional technology provided water for crops, livestock, and humans. Now, let's say these wells made human-made oases possible. Even the closest municipality name was an indication that this could be true. The name Fagaret Esaoia is actually named after Fagarets, these ancient wells. Now, this lead was proving to be very accurate. You decide to travel over there to see for yourself. You take a local bus, sit back, and enjoy the ride. The landscape in northern Algeria is filled with ancient-looking towns. You even see ruins of wells along the way, on the outskirts of smaller cities. Opening Google's satellite images, you can see the Kanat's markings on the ground. 
a series of holes running down several miles. But as soon as you arrive, you find out you were wrong. Dale Lightfoot, one of the world's leading experts on canards, said that the circles were definitely not canards. Even the satellite images confirm this difference. Uh-oh, we were so close! Apparently, canards or fagras would not run down a straight line. They wouldn't be shaped like circles. Another clue that this wasn't the case was that there were no towns at the end. The circles were really far away from any human activity, and canards were explicitly built to provide water for human settlements. Well, it sure was a good try. You almost gave up on this mystery when you decided to take one more field trip. It was days of preparation, pick up cars, food, equipment, all so that the mystery of the Sahara circles could be unraveled. On the first day, you drove over 99 miles into the desert. You were always curious to see what this part of the world looked like. Over there, you see nothing but mustard yellow dunes. The night sky is pretty decent, though. You can see the entire Milky Way with your own eyes. You set up camp and sleep under a canopy of stars. The next day, tension grows. There's no cell reception. Oh dear. But thankfully, you added the coordinates of the circles to your Google map. And surprise, the offline mode works out there. You follow the coordinates, but it leads you astray. You start to get nervous, thinking this was all in vain. But you and the team get into the car and drive a few more miles past the coordinates on your phone. After a very bumpy ride, you can't believe your eyes. There it is, an enormous crater dug on the sand, surrounded by 12 smaller holes. From up high, it looks like a clock. Without the pointers, of course. On the ground, they're very faint. So faint, you almost miss them. Searching the area, you notice all the holes had something similar. Metal wires. Thin wires that you can pull from the ground. They're buried deep, so you start digging. An object starts to reveal itself. Uh Uh-oh! It looks like old dynamite. This certainly surprises you. Um, better stop digging to avoid any accidents. At the end of the survey, you feel satisfied, but still curious. What could all this dynamite mean? And who put it there? What comes next is the turning point of your adventure. Walking back to the car, you see something shining on the ground. You approach the item with curiosity. It's round and rusty and looks like a sardine can. What's that doing here? Could this give you more clues about the circle's mystery? Just in case, you pick it up and put it in the car. Back in the city, the puzzle pieces start to reveal the story behind the Sahara circles. You bring photos in the sardine can and show them to local experts. They analyze your material and give you an intriguing verdict. As it turns out, guess number one was the closest one to the truth. So what happened to the first guess? Why do we need to keep digging deeper? Well, because it was only half right. The Sahara circles are not a historical footprint of seismic surveying. Back when the circles were made, this technology didn't even exist. But they sure are related to oil exploration. The dynamite-filled holes were an old method for oil searching. The circles are the leftovers of surveyors looking for resources underground. And the sardine cans? Well, they were left by the workers who held explosion works. You gotta eat, right? According to the model of the can, this happened more or less around the 1950s and 1960s. So these circles aren't even that ancient. More like modern ones, if you ask me. Well, well, well. Hope you are glad you tagged along and helped unravel this mystery. See you in the next mystery-solving adventure. You go for a hike in the steep mountains of Mammoth Lakes, California. The terrain is rugged and difficult. The icy snow makes it harder to walk. Halfway along the hike, you spot something out of the ordinary. From a distance, you spot scattered stuff lying on the rocky ground. You walk a little closer to have a clearer look and see what appears to be the remains of an airplane. It turns out that the debris belonged to record-breaking pilot Steve Fawcett. Authorities had been looking for him for almost a year. No one could find him and explain what caused his plane to crash. It seemed like such an easy flight for an experienced pilot. So what could have happened to him? You see, years before this tragic event, Fawcett was attempting a much riskier feat. 
he was trying to be the first pilot to fly around the world solo in a hot air balloon. Now, can you imagine spending two weeks in a tiny container just to break a world record? If you're wondering, here's what you'll need to fly around the globe. A sound navigation system, a wealthy sponsor, and tireless endurance. Even though balloons are the oldest flying vehicle, no one until Fawcett managed to fly around the world with them. And it sure wasn't a breeze. It's day one of Fawcett's second attempt to fly around the world in a balloon. The year is 1997, and an anxious crowd gathers in St. Louis, waiting for Fawcett's takeoff. The pilot walks into the stadium with a big smile. He certainly doesn't look the part of an adventurer trying to achieve the impossible. But this is the trip of his life. To prepare, he trained to acclimatize himself to an altitude of 12,000 feet. The conditions are harsh. He's flying in an unpressurized cabin and in between the clouds. It seems unlikely he'll make it all the way, but there he goes. The balloon launches into the air. The crowd beneath is cheering and waving him goodbye. The wind of about 5 knots allows the balloon to launch. On the first night, one of his heaters breaks. It is freezing outside the cabin, but he gets through the night. Fawcett's secret weapon is the world's first balloon autopilot. It gets lonely up there, and the constant need to focus makes one very soon tired. At night, he turns on the autopilot to get some sleep. It fires the burners in a computer program sequence and keeps the balloon on the flight path. Fawcett needs to wake up and operate the burners to change the altitude. After three days, a first victory. He has flown across the Atlantic Ocean. He flies solo, but a team accompanies him on the ground. They communicate mostly through email sent via satellite. At the end of the first week, the Mission Control Center receives an alarming email from Fawcett. Dark clouds are mounting on the horizon. It looks like the weather is turning against him. He can see the thunderstorm from the balloon, but there is no way to predict how strong it is. Fawcett is determined to fly through the clouds despite the risks. He is flying at 1,000 feet above the ground with no visibility. Somehow, he makes it through. His flight continues through Libya, Iran, and India. It looks like nothing will stop him now, but he is already exhausted. He is uncertain how much longer he can keep going. Inside the balloon, the meals are small rations, and he uses a bucket as a toilet. Unfortunately, he has lost a lot of fuel while crossing the Atlantic. Halfway through India, the balloon crashes into a tree. He flew an astounding 9,600 miles from St. Louis until his landing spot. Steve didn't achieve his goal, but he won't give up. To finally be successful, Fawcett needs to change his strategy. His new plan is to fly over the southern hemisphere. It was the first time anyone would ever try that. His idea is simple. In the southern part of the globe, he would fly mostly over water. This would help him fly faster as he would only need flight permission from five countries along the way. If you were on the ground as Fawcett flew by, maybe you wondered what that flying object in the sky was. As he flew over Cape Town in South Africa, over 50 people reported seeing strange flying objects. Sorry to disappoint your fantasy folks, but it was just Steve Fawcett and his balloon. His first attempt to fly around the world through the Southern Hemisphere almost worked out. He got lucky. When he reached Australia, he caught a jet stream that helped him speed up to about 115 knots. That's three times the speed of a gazelle. Morale was high as Fawcett had already broken his distance record by flying over 13,500 miles. Under his feet, the beautiful Australian landscape is filled with deserts and dry lakes. He crossed the Australian coast at 8.22 p.m. local time. And his next expected landfall was in Chile, over 7,500 miles away. But again, a huge thunderstorm got in his way. After entering the storm, the balloon showed how fragile it was. The lightning and fierce winds tore the balloon apart. This time, he wouldn't make it through. He fell into the ocean as the balloon caught fire. A rescue team waited until morning to go look for Fawcett. A Hercules aircraft rescued him from open waters. In his sixth attempt, Fawcett made it around the world in a hot air balloon. The Spirit of Freedom balloon landed in Queensland, Australia after a two-week flight across the globe. He flew at speeds of over 200 miles per hour and journeyed over 19,263 miles. 
Fawcett had done it. He was the first solo pilot to cross the world in a balloon. However, he didn't stop there. Soon after breaking this world record, he wanted to do the same on a different vehicle. He convinced Richard Branson, the owner of Virgin Atlantic, to fund a single jet-powered aircraft, later called the Virgin Atlantic Global Flyer. On the 8th of February 2005, the Global Flyer took off. It set out to circumnavigate the Tropic of Cancer, an incredible length of around 23,000 miles. Out of luck, or sheer ingenuity, Fawcett broke yet another world record. He overcame a major fuel loss early on in the flight and made it all the way back to Salina in Kansas, where he originally departed from. Did this story make you want to hop on a hot air balloon? Fawcett was the expert in aerial adventures and extreme conditions. This is why his disappearance in the Sierra Nevada mountains was full of mystery. What could have happened to take down such an experienced pilot? On the 3rd of September 2007, Fawcett took off from a Nevada ranch with this single-engine plane named Super Decathlon. It was a simple, leisurely day flight that took a dark turn. Fawcett never made it back to the ranch. A search-and-rescue team was sent to find the pilot and his plane, but they returned empty-handed. It wasn't until a year later that a hiker found some of Fawcett's belongings near Mammoth Lakes. Then an aerial search located the remains of Fawcett's two-seater at an elevation of 10,000 feet. The mystery was solved with the help of advanced technology. In the world's first hexagonal wind tunnel facility, experts recreated the weather conditions of the day of Fawcett's flight. They were trying to understand if the downdrafts from the Sierra Nevada mountains could have brought his plane to the ground. With the help of a smaller plane replica, they made a disturbing discovery. That day, visibility was normal, but the wind currents swelled the plane like a leaf. A sudden downdraft most likely disoriented Fawcett and made him lose control of the aircraft, causing him to crash directly into the mountains. The plane's engine wasn't powerful enough to overcome the wind forcing it into the ground. It turns out it was entirely out of Fawcett's control. The discovery of the debris brought closure to this unfortunate case. The dark days are mysterious natural phenomena that have occurred only a few times in the history of humankind. We can write them off as eclipses or just some weather events, but in reality, they're very creepy and we have no idea why they happen. So what are these dark days anyway? What's so strange about them? Let's try to find out. The sun is off. What are we going to do? That's what the residents of Yamal, Siberia asked meteorologists on September 18, 1938. In the morning, instead of going to work, they all gathered at the weather station. They were waiting for answers. All because on that day, they observed something inexplicable, an eclipse which they later nicknamed the Black Day. And neither astronomers nor meteorologists can explain what happened back then. Here's how one of them described this event. At 8.30 a.m., we noted a decrease in light. At the same time, the color of the clouds began to acquire a yellowish-brown, sometimes red-brown hue. By 9 a.m., the lighting had changed dramatically. It was as if you were looking at the world through a dark light filter. The brown tones of the clouds intensified. By 10.30 a.m., the sky and Earth didn't differ from each other in lighting and color. Everything seemed homogenous black, absolutely devoid of light. Pretty creepy, right? And that's not all. The city was also plunged into complete radio silence. Meteorologists couldn't even contact the authorities, and local residents were unable to set up any stations. Everyone was in the dark, both literally and figuratively. Meteorologists decided to try and launch several flares. The flares soared into the air towards the heavy dark clouds hanging over the city and disappeared. The clouds were so dense that the flares were completely invisible. At the same time, the weather was perfectly fine. Everything was quiet. And this black silence lasted for about an hour. After that, the black day ended as unexpectedly as it began. Even more baffling, those strange clouds left literally no trace. No rain, no dust, nothing. 
After that event, researchers found out that the Black Day had spread for 125 to 155 miles around. They also learned that the dark band was moving from west to east. After passing through the southern part of the Yamal Peninsula, it headed on for a while and then disappeared completely. Yamal isn't the only place where this phenomenon occurred. In fact, similar eclipses have been happening in different parts of Earth for many years. For example, in New England, on May 19, 1780, people there witnessed an event that was later called New England's Dark Day, but it lasted not one day, but several. A few days before this event, the sky turned yellow, and on May 19, in broad daylight, it suddenly turned black. Here's what one of the witnesses, Joseph Plum Martin, later told the press. It was very dark. People had to light candles in their houses to carry on with their usual business. The night was as uncommonly dark as the day was. The smell of soot reigned in the air. Nearby rivers were covered with a thin layer of ash. When the real night came, people noticed through the clouds that the moon had turned dark red. Only a couple of days later, people were finally able to see stars through the veil of clouds. And then everything suddenly returned to normal. No one had any idea what had happened. 22 years later, on June 2nd, 1802, a schooner named El Dorado sailed across the Pacific Ocean. Suddenly, they were overtaken by complete darkness. There was no storm and the ocean was completely calm, but the whole sky was covered with black clouds. These clouds dissipated after half an hour and left no trace. And again, 74 years later, one of the dark waves happened in Wisconsin on March 19, 1886. It was 3 p.m., and this time, the wave was very short. It lasted only 5 to 10 minutes. A sudden night fell on the city. Frightened horses were neighing, and terrified people were running around, trying to find a place to hide. When everything calmed down, local newspapers reported that the wave passed from west to east. There was no solar eclipse, no winds or hurricanes, nothing that could cause the darkness over the city. And finally, once again, it happened on December 2nd, 1904, in Memphis. Or rather, that's what rumors claim, since there's no scientific evidence of this event. It was clear and cold dawn over Bluff City. People were doing their usual Friday morning chores. Then, around 9 in the morning, without any warning, the sun suddenly disappeared from the sky. It took only a minute for the bright sunny day to turn into pitch darkness. People interrupted their work, and children in schools were completely terrified. And just like in previous cases, the weather was perfectly calm. It lasted for about half an hour, and then suddenly ended. A little later, Following a mysterious eclipse, a ferocious storm hit the city. So, what's going on? All these strange cases can surely be explained scientifically, right? Well, actually, scientists don't have a definite answer. All these events are very similar, but we don't have a single explanation that could cover them all. Let's take a look at some theories. The first thought that comes to mind, it's probably a partial or total eclipse. But no, this is not the case. There were no eclipses on those days. And even if we consider this theory, before any eclipse, the sky darkens gradually. Eclipses themselves only last a couple of minutes, certainly not a few hours or even days. Also, unlike eclipses, these events were local to specific cities. Well, maybe it's some other astronomical event. Some scientists believe that during the event on Yamal, a band of cosmic dust touched Earth, but later they found out that no astronomical bodies approached the planet that day. All right, any other ideas? Forest fires could be the reason. When a large area of forest is burning at the same time, a column of air can rise to great heights, like three to four miles. These air flows carry ash and other burnt stuff to different places. And since all these things are so high in the sky, they simply freeze there and turn into something resembling black clouds. That was probably the case for New England. At that time, a wave of forest fires broke out in Canada. They could easily spread through the north of the US. Also, just look at this description. Yellowed sky, the smell of soot, ash on the water. 
Everything sounds logical, but this theory of fires only works for the event in New England. What about the other cases? Where would you find a forest fire in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, for example? All right, moving on. Scientists tried to explain the story from Memphis by saying it could be a hurricane, but the black cloud swept through the city before the storm, not during or after it. And it wasn't some kind of typical storm cloud, it was full-fledged night darkness. So what's really going on? Now, meteorologists call this phenomenon a local decrease in the transparency of the atmosphere. Unlike solar eclipses, this darkness is denser. It also covers only a small area. The transparency of the atmosphere is its ability to let through radiation and light. It's basically, how well can I see distant objects? Everything can get dark and blurry, for example, because of the dust in the air, volcanic eruptions, fogs, and so on. So, according to this theory, dark days are just an extreme drop in the transparency of the atmosphere. But it's still strange. If that's the case, shouldn't everything have been covered with thick fog or something like that? Yeah, it was very dark. But when people lit the lamps, the visibility was pretty good. Nothing blocked the view except the black clouds that covered the sun. In other words, this phenomenon is very hard to explain. As far as we know, it happened only five to six times in the history of humankind. If there were other cases, they weren't documented. This phenomenon is impossible to predict and no one knows how it works, as well as where and when it will happen next time. And although there are many hypotheses, none of them can be verified. Maybe if these events happen again in the future, we'll be able to study them better. But unfortunately, at the moment, the dark days remain a mystery. On August 2, 1996, huge, mysterious patterns appeared on an agricultural field in Chiseldon, England. No one knew what kinds of symbols those were and who left them. As soon as the local news reported this, people immediately began to make their guesses. The most popular version was a message from a civilization living on another planet. The first crop circles appeared in the 70s in many areas across the U.S. and England. Some compared these symbols to the writings of the ancient Maya. Others thought those were messages about the approaching apocalypse. But few doubted that their authors were from another civilization. But that geometric pattern in Chiseldon was different from all the others because of an event that happened eight years later. In 2004, a man from New Mexico found a strange stone 11 miles from Roswell. The rock had the same pattern on it as the crop circle in Chiseldon. It's worth noting that Roswell became a famous place after, according to rumors and legends, a spaceship from another planet crashed there. Therefore, when the farmer found the stone and posted its photo on the internet, many people thought it was part of that spaceship. The stone was perfectly smooth, and the pattern was applied with incredible precision. But the most remarkable thing was its magnetic properties. It rotated counterclockwise when people put the magnet next to its northern part. When they left the magnet near the southern side, the stone turned in the other direction. Computed tomography and x-rays showed that there hadn't been any elements inside the stone that could cause rotation. It was just a smooth piece of rock. But was the Roswell rock really part of a spaceship? To answer this question, we need to move to England, the year 1976. An artist named Doug Bauer met his friend Dave Corley and invited him to create an impressive performance. At that time, people only learned about strange patterns in the fields from some books and records. And of course, none of these cases had been confirmed. The two friends understood that all this was nothing more than myths. Therefore, they decided to draw a big pattern in a wheat field in Wiltshire. Now, they didn't expect this drawing to become so popular. Many newspapers began to write about mysterious circles. Hundreds of reporters filmed it on their cameras, and people watching TV were shocked. From that moment on, crop circles became a cultural phenomenon. People mixed facts with fiction and created more and more unbelievable legends. Someone said that they had seen mysterious lights in the sky above the circles. In any case, those two friends continued to draw patterns and revealed their secret only in 2009. They also created the mysterious drawing in Chiseldon. 
but that Roswell Rock wasn't their job. Anyway, they said that the stone was also a fake. Other artists could draw the same pattern on the rock using stone-cutting equipment. One of the most mysterious books in the world is the Voynich Manuscript. Nobody knows who its author was, but they wrote it in the 15th century. No one can understand the contents of this manuscript, consisting of 240 pages, for more than 500 years. Now, just imagine all the words were written in hand in an unknown language. Almost every page is decorated with strange images of female figures and weird unknown plants. The book was first discovered in 1912 and immediately became a cultural phenomenon. Many scientists, polyglots, and historians have tried to decipher the language and understand its meaning. They put it on the internet so everyone could try to solve the mystery. And it seems that Nicholas Gibbs, a historian and writer, managed to do this. He spent many years studying medieval Latin language and literature. Gibbs noticed the manuscript contained Latin abbreviations often used in medieval medical papers and reference books. Gibbs even found out that the book was a plagiarism of other older medical reference works. He compared the Voynich manuscript with other Latin books and found many similar words. Gibbs claimed that the manuscript was dedicated to women's health, and the mysterious flowers were real herbs and plants. But it wasn't that simple. Nicholas Gibbs was one of many who put forward the theory. Many scientists recognized his version as banal and unconvincing. Other decoders claimed that some secret code was used in the manuscript. Some were sure it was written by Dominican nuns. Others described it as a reference book on astrology and herbs. Anyway, you can find scans of the manuscript in high resolution on the internet and try to crack the code yourself. Imagine that you're walking around New York and entering a dark, deserted alley. Then you see some canvas with a beautiful picture on it lying in a trash can. You don't really understand what exactly is depicted there, but you still feel some power of art emanating from it. You take the painting home and hang it on the wall. It's been hanging there almost four years. Then you publish a photo with the painting on the website with antiques and discover that this picture is a missing masterpiece worth $1 million. This is a real story that happened to a New Yorker in 2003. Famous Mexican artist Rufino Tamayo painted this picture called Three People in 1970. One collector bought it as a gift for his wife. But in 1989, someone stole the work while they were moving to a new house. It was possible that the thief didn't appreciate this piece of art or couldn't find a buyer, so they threw it into the nearest trash can. The woman who found it returned the work to the owner and received a $15,000 reward. Expensive paintings often end up in trash cans. Van Gogh gave his works to various people, but they didn't take them seriously at that time. When these paintings were found many years later, they were estimated at tens of millions of dollars. For example, the artist gave his doctor his portrait. The doctor was horrified by the painting. Perhaps he didn't like the red shade of the hair. He gave the portrait to his mother, and she found a use for it. She covered the hole in her chicken coop with the picture. For more than 10 years, chickens had been running under the work of art. Then another artist found the painting. He paid the doctor pennies for it. Now it's estimated at $50 million. A similar case with a discarded work of art occurred in Italy. A gardener who worked at the Ricci Adi Gallery of Modern Art was removing ivy from the building's walls and found a rusty metal door in the thicket. He opened it and got into a dark room. There was a garbage bag lying there. The gardener wanted to throw it in the trash but decided to look inside first. And he found the lost work of famous artist Gustav Klimt. During the renovation of the gallery in 1997, someone stole the painting, Portrait of a Lady. It turned out that the thief had never taken it out of the building. Its value is estimated at $66 million. In 1901, collectors of sea sponges discovered a mysterious chest in the sea near Greece. There was a strange object inside, similar to a mechanical watch and the size of a shoebox. The finding attracted the attention of archaeologists. They quickly established that this item was created in ancient Greece about 2,200 years ago. They called it the Antikythera mechanism. 
Now it's in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Scientists have found out that this object is only 82 fragments, one-third of the original mechanism. It's still unknown who created it and how it works. But experts think it was a mechanical computer with bronze gears and other parts. People used it for astronomical calculations. The device could track the movements of the Sun, the Moon, and five planets of the solar system. Experts are still trying to figure out all the properties of this machine. It's considered to be the oldest computer on Earth. It proves that the level of technology 2,000 years ago was much higher than we could imagine. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you were probably mesmerized by its geysers, which spew superheated water and steam high into the air. But an even more intriguing thing actually hides underground. I'm talking about that underfoot plumbing system that makes those grand eruptions possible. About that, there's good news. Recently, researchers have succeeded in mapping the National Park's hydrothermal plumbing system with the help of a giant flying magnet. As a result, scientists have managed to document all these features in stunning detail. The thing is, Yellowstone houses the world's largest hydrothermal system. It contains over 10,000 features, like geysers, mud pots, hot springs, and steam vents. They're fed by a network of underground water pathways. Those get overheated by magma flowing underground. It causes the water to rise to the surface. Now, no one actually knows much about the workings of this system but the newly created maps might finally shed light on it. Experts explain that their knowledge of Yellowstone has a subsurface gap. That's why it's often called a mystery sandwich. Scientists know quite a lot about the features on the surface because they can observe them directly. And they know what's going on in the magmatic and tectonic system several miles below the surface. But they haven't figured out what's happening in the middle yet. So, I must tell you about that giant flying magnet used for research. It's known as SkyTem. It was attached to a helicopter and flown over Yellowstone several hundred times, scanning the ground below. The magnet is made up of an 82-foot-wide charged wire loop. Its main task is to generate a strong electromagnetic field. And since different kinds of material, like water or rock, respond to this field differently, scientists managed to create a few subsurface maps for the first time ever. The mapping technique also allowed the researchers to differentiate between magma and bedrock, since they have a bit different magnetic properties. And the team got a chance to see how the magma and water interact and create those mind-blowing geological features on the surface. The team got high-resolution maps to a depth of around 500 and 2300 feet, and low-resolution maps showing what's going on at a depth of up to one and a half miles. At the same time, the researchers think that the hydrothermal system itself may stretch as far as three miles below the surface. If they're right, it means they've only mapped the top half of Yellowstone's plumbing system. Anyway, remember how I said that scientists know pretty much about the bottom part of the Yellowstone sandwich? They have such a good idea about the tectonic plates and deep fault lines because the park's frequent earthquakes provide them with a lot of opportunities to study different phenomena. In July 2021, for example, more than 1,000 earthquakes rocked the area. These days, the team of researchers knows much more about some famous features, like the old faithful geyser or the Grand Prismatic Spring. They've also found out that individual hydrothermal features on the surface can actually be connected to others, which can be as far as 6 miles away from them. Another interesting discovery is that even though Yellowstone geysers and hot springs vary in size, shape, color, volatility, and chemical composition, they are mostly fed by very similar underground sources. That means that the difference between the features appears closer to the surface. Now, I'm sure you've seen the iconic image of Yellowstone with a large rainbow-colored spring, fiery orange at its edges. So what makes these hot springs so colorful? Surprisingly, these awesome hues come from microscopic creatures. The temperatures in the springs are so high, they can easily and quickly cook you. Plus, the water there is super acidic, like the liquid in a car battery. But there are certain types of heat-loving microbes that don't mind these crazy conditions. You can even say they're thriving there. 
So every ring of a different color is, in most cases, a ring inhabited by different bacteria. And each species is adapted to a particular temperature or pH level, which measures how acidic this or that environment is. For example, take the Grand Prismatic Spring, yes, the iconic one. Its rainbow hues likely hint at the diversity of microbes living there. So, starting from the center of the hot spring, you can see a beautiful aquamarine color there. That's where the water temperature is the highest, reaching 189 degrees Fahrenheit, because this area is right over the underground water source. The water there is too hot even for microbes. That's why what you see is mostly clear water. As for the reason for its blue color, it's the same as why the sky is blue. Sunlight hits the surface of the water, and the light scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, getting reflected back to your eyes. Now, the next ring of color is yellow, all thanks to certain cyanobacteria. The temperature in this yellow ring reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If the conditions in the hot spring were a bit different, these bacteria would create a blue-green hue, thanks to a green pigment called chlorophyll. But since the sunlight hitting the spring is too intense, the bacteria start producing another type of pigment. It's called carotenoids. And guess what? It acts as a sunscreen for the bacteria. And since this pigment is orange, the normally green bacteria get a yellowish hue. And finally, we've got that bright orange color closer to the edges of the prismatic spring. It's a bit cooler there, around 149 degrees Fahrenheit. In this part of the spring, you can find several types of bacteria. They all produce substances that give the spring this bright orange color. And finally, right at the edges of the spring, the temperature is cooler, around 131 degrees, and a greater variety of microbes can survive there. All of them combined give the edges of the spring that red-brown hue. But scientists believe that people and their activity may have influenced the colors of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. For example, in the past, the temperatures in the morning glory pool used to be much higher than they are today. That's why its color was a deep blue. But trash has started to accumulate in the pool, and some of it clogged the vent. This caused the temperatures to drop, which led to microbial growth. As a result, that pretty blue color turned into orange-yellow. As for Yellowstone's geysers, the most famous one is called Old Faithful. It got this name at the end of the 19th century because of how regular its eruptions were. This geyser is more active than the others, erupting about 20 times a day. Each of these magnificent events lasts from 1 to 5 minutes, and the fountain of steaming water can reach a height of 180 feet. Now, while talking about Yellowstone National Park, we can't but mention Yellowstone Supervolcano, right? Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. You don't necessarily want to be around for that. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost 3 feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5-15%. to 15%. Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hot spot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of Yellowstone Volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago, long before video. The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone caldera after spilling out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. No thanks, I'll pass. Ships and planes disappearing without a trace. Passengers never seen or heard from again. Reports of strange lights in the sky. No, these aren't scenes from an upcoming Hollywood blockbuster. 
but some of the strange occurrences reported for over a century in an area ominously dubbed the Graveyard of Lake Ontario, also referred to as Canada's Bermuda Triangle, or the Marysburg Vortex. It stretches across a portion of Lake Ontario from Kingston to Prince Edward County in Canada and down to Oswego, New York in the US. The tales about this area can be as chilling as the frigid lake water on which they took place. The most unsettling story involves the schooner called the Bavaria. It was 1889 and the ship was being towed across the lake. Rough waters severed the tow rope and the Bavaria floated away. Luckily, the schooner was later found safe and fully intact. But there was one thing missing, the crew. Not a single person was found on board. What makes the story even more bizarre is that the dinner table was set. A loaf of bread was discovered, freshly baked, and the captain's money and his papers were fully accounted for. There was even a pet canary happily chirping away as if nothing was amiss. What happened to the crew? We may never know. And this was not a unique incident. Just over a decade later, in 1900, three ships, the Annie Minnis, the Picton, and the Acacia, were sailing across the lake. But only two would make it to their final destination. The third one, the Picton, was speeding ahead of the others when it simply vanished. According to a cook on the Annie Minnis, we were well out into the lake and making good time when all of a sudden we saw the Picton's topsails coming off and then her lower sail settled. And then, while we stood and watched, the Picton just disappeared. It's possible that the ship sank, as there was some wreckage later seen in the water, but the ship itself was never found, and none of its crew ever located. A few weeks later, a bottle with a note inside was discovered in Sackett's Harbor, New York. The note was from Captain Sidley of the Picton. Have lashed Vessie to me with heaving line, so that we will be found together. Vessie was the captain's 12-year-old son. The note creates more questions than answers. If the witnesses were correct, the ship's disappearance was quite quick. When did Captain Sidley know he was in danger? Why not signal for help if he had any warning? And when did he have time to write a note, bottle it, and tie himself to his son? It truly is a mystery. And it was not just ships that ran afoul of the strange forces in the area. Planes also struggled to make it through in one piece. In 1975, Ron Scott flew out from the Picton Airport in his Cessna 172. As he entered the Marysburg Vortex, his plane banked to the side. For several seconds, he was unable to right the plane, but once he did, the same force banked him to the other side. Again, he was stuck there for a few seconds, unable to control his plane. A skilled pilot, he had never experienced anything like it before. He was certainly luckier than Royal Canadian Air Force pilot Barry Allen Newman. Newman was at the same spot back in 1952, when he lost control of his jet and crashed into the lake. To this day, his body has not been found. In total, over 270 ships and at least 40 planes have met a tragic end in this area. And adding to the mystery, sometimes people report a series of bright lights or orbs, or a dark ship hovering in the sky. These are even harder to explain. Witnesses willing to report them are adamant they are true. Sid Wells said he watched a strange shape like a multifaceted diamond slowly spinning in the sky. And then it just disappeared. Others claim to have seen it too. Of course, the Marysburg Vortex is just one of several places around the world known as vile vortices, a term coined by biologist and writer Ivan T. Sanderson. He discovered 12 other equally spaced areas on the surface of Earth where funny things happen. The best known of these, of course, is the dreaded Bermuda Triangle. Situated in the Atlantic Ocean between Bermuda, Florida, and Puerto Rico, it has been blamed for the disappearance of thousands of people. They went in, on boats or in planes, but they never came out. Even the explorer Christopher Columbus experienced the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle during his first voyage to America in 1492. He said the compasses pointed in the wrong direction, the sea levels seemed to change dramatically, and he even spotted strange lights in the sky. In 1918, the USS Cyclops, which was one of the US Navy's biggest fuel ships, disappeared there. Since the 309 crew members were declared lost at sea when the Cyclops vanished, it's seen as the largest loss of life 
in the history of the U.S. Navy in a single incident. At the time, the weather was good. The one message sent that day from the ship indicated no issues or concerns, and a distress signal was never sent. A thorough naval investigation followed. Its conclusion? Many theories have been advanced, but none that satisfactorily accounts for the ship's disappearance. In other words, the investigators were stumped. There's also the Dragon's Triangle, located in the Pacific Ocean. The most disturbing story involves a group of Japanese vessels that disappeared in the 1950s. When researchers were sent to investigate what happened, they too disappeared. In each case, it's impossible to truly know what occurred. And it's easy to get caught up in stories of giant sea monsters lurking beneath the waves. Who doesn't like a good scare? And Sanderson was willing to accept the possibility of such stories being true. He believed the vile vortices that he studied could be explained by anything from a wrinkle in the space-time continuum, to magnetic abnormalities, to underwater people. Of course, Sanderson was not only a huge fan of strange places, he also wrote about strange creatures like Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. His skills as an impartial scientist are questionable though. In 1948, he claimed that some three-toed footprints found at Clearwater Beach in Florida were proof of 15-foot-tall penguins, arguing that they were impossible to fake. In 1988, Tony Cingerini revealed that he and his friend, attaching some cast-iron feet to his high-top sneakers, were behind the giant penguin hoax. So maybe Sanderson isn't the most reliable source after all. But there are also some very compelling and wholly natural explanations. Let's look specifically at the Marysburg Vortex. It's entirely possible that ships like the Bavaria and the Picton were done in by a mix of bad luck and bad weather. Unsettled weather is certainly not uncommon on Lake Ontario, and flash storms on the open water can prove dangerous to the most skilled sailor. And even today, with advances in weather forecasting, we get it wrong all the time. Back then, there was no way to predict that a storm was just around the corner. And the weather was just one issue. Historian Mark Seguin said that the area was always known to be dangerous, as the lake bed quickly becomes shallow along the eastern shore. There are also small rocky islands and shoals scattered throughout the area, making sailing a risky venture, especially for larger vessels or those weighed down by heavy cargo. By the mid-20th century, modern weather forecasting and improved shipbuilding alleviated most of the hazards of the Great Lakes shipping, resulting in fewer losses. The last major shipwreck in any of the Great Lakes was that of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald, which sank off the coast of Lake Superior in 1975, with 29 crew members going down with it. It seems the vortex is no match for human progress. And as for lights or images in the sky? In most cases, it's the result of an interesting phenomenon called thermal or temperature inversion. When this happens, a layer of warm air becomes trapped under cold air. This can result in mirages or reflections. So, a light on the ground that is miles away can be reflected in the sky, giving the impression of a flying object. Other parts of the mystery may be solved with a little time. Lake Ontario's freshwater and frigid temperatures help preserve the ships and planes that came to rest there. As divers and researchers continue to explore the area, maybe we'll finally learn the fate of the Bavaria, the Picton, Captain Sidley, and his son. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright